it should be recording now. So uh, thank you everyone for, for making some time tonight and uh, special thanks to Dave um, for making time in what is an incredibly busy period of time um, within soccer in Canada as we all navigate uh, COVID-19 and all of the different challenges that it brings. Um, we're incredibly excited to have Dave present about the principles in action because um, I, I think understanding the, the principles and understanding the why gives everybody um, more information and context in which to really um, dive into the Canada Soccer Club licensing program and continue to improve their organizations. And so the fact that there's so many people on this call today just shows the amount of people that are interested in um, continuing the, the work and development within uh, their respective organizations. So thank you all for being on the call and Dave, special thanks for making you know time to spend with us and, and talk to us a bit more about the club licensing program. So I'm gonna hand it over to you and uh, we'll just let me know what you need from me as, as the session goes on. You're muted. I'm mute. Off to a good start with the technology. <laughs> thanks, Raheem, and thanks everyone for making the time. I know uh, all of you this time of year would probably much rather be out on the field somewhere, uh, myself included, but I uh, do appreciate you making the time. I know balancing uh, thinking about return to play with uh, all of the things that are going on in your club and personal lives is a challenge for all of us. So I uh, appreciate you making the time. Hopefully you'll find that it's, uh, that it's value well spent. I'm going to spend about 45 minutes to an hour or so talking a little bit about uh, the club licensing principles and going a little bit more detail in terms of, of how they can be applied within the club environment. And then that'll leave us with plenty of time for questions and conversation if there is any. Uh, uh, but certainly don't take offense if, uh, if everybody's got uh, other places they need to go to and other commitments that they need to live up to. So just while I get started here, I'm just going to turn my video off because uh, I've already gotten a little message about the stability of my internet. So sometimes when the video is on and I'm running a presentation at the same time, uh, the video or the uh, the audio doesn't always come out clearly, which is the most important thing. So uh, as disappointing as it will be for all of you to not be able to look at me as I present, uh, I'm sure uh, a lot of you that know me a little bit better will be relieved at that. So appreciate the time. I'm just going to turn my video off and uh, we'll get into it. So before we can talk about uh, how we're going to use principles, uh, principles-based approach, the first thing that we need to really think about is what is a principle? We need to understand what it is and define it before we can really understand how to use it. So what is a principle? From dictionary definition, a principle is a fundamental truth or proposition that serves as a foundation for a system of belief or behavior or for a chain of reasoning. So because it's a dictionary definition. It's uh, pretty complex and uh, doesn't maybe resonate as well with people as it should. So if we dig a little bit deeper and pull out kind of the important pieces to that, for me, what we're talking about here is a proposition that serves as the foundation for a system of behavior. And What's important to consider with that is that it serves as a foundation. So what that means is it goes beyond just something that's nice to have and sits off to the side. It really does underline everything that we do and it's a part of everything that we're uh, involved in as it comes to our system. And the other part for me that's really important is that this is about behavior. It's about guiding our behaviors towards what we all believe is the right way to behave within our soccer system. So. When we start from that perspective, I think it gives us a little bit of a foundation to understand what we're talking about. So really, are we're talking about things that are foundational to our system and behavior guiding and will help us to be able to move forward with our new system. So why principles? The main reason is that they provide direction, but they don't provide detailed prescription. So what that means is they provide guidance without necessarily telling you what to do. This is a really important concept because first of all, if uh, you're like me, nobody really likes to be told what to do. So it's helpful to be guided rather than directed. And the second piece is it also allows organizations to develop and select the methods by which they will operate. So what that means is each organization is different and unique. So they've all got different available resources. They've got a unique situation or context in which they operate. 
the reality is that you know your organization better than I do, better than Raheem does, better than anyone does, because you work in that reality every day. So for us to be prescriptive and tell you this is how we should do things is a bit of a challenge because you know better than we, we do the types of things that work in your environment and by extension the types of things that may not work as well. So providing that kind of general direction allows you to use your local knowledge and expertise to be able to implement that in the way that makes the most sense. So to look at it another way, principles provide the destination. So it tells us where we want to go and what we want to be, but it's up to you as organizations to use your knowledge to determine how to get there. So the way that you approach moving from A to B is going to be different from your neighbors, is going to be different from the people down the street uh, and across the country. I get the opportunity to give these types of presentations and have these types of conversations with people from across the country. And what I've come to recognize is A, Canada is a big place and B, there's so many different realities that we need to understand. And it's impossible for any one person or any group of people to understand all of those realities. So what we need to do is create an overall system or an overall structure that's based on principles that we all agree to and allow individuals to use those in the best way that they possibly can based on their local and regional realities to be able to deliver programs and services that make sense in their environments. So that's kind of a global approach or a global definition of what principles are. Our club licensing program is based around seven guiding principles. I mean, I'm going to spend a little bit of time to talk about each one and provide a, a little bit of context in terms of how different types of organizations might be implementing these and why they're important. So, our first guiding principle, prioritize fun. Number one reason why kids play sport is that it's fun. Unfortunately, the number one reason why kids leave sport is it's no longer fun. And that's based on research. And there's some research coming out of George Washington University in the States among young soccer players that's found that there are 11 dimensions of fun. So these are listed off to the, uh, the right-hand side here in the slide. These are all the different things that kids, when they play soccer, consider fun. As an extension of that, there's 81 different individual fun determinants that were identified by these individuals. What I think the biggest takeaway here is, is that the most important things to the kids that, that provided information into this uh, research project is that positive team dynamics, trying hard and positive coaching are the three things that have the biggest impact on their experience and the fun that they have. Some other pieces that I found interesting, winning ranked number 40 out of 81, so somewhere around the middle even though that's often the focus of our programming and our, uh, our competitive environments. And tournaments, which we all think, oh, tournaments are a blast, they're a lot of fun. It actually ranked only 58th out of 81 in terms of what the kids themselves identified as the uh, determinants of their fun in their experience. The other part that I found fascinating about this is that while certainly there's individual and team differences, the newest research tells us that groups are more similar than they are different. So what counts most for girls and boys are things like trying your best, working hard, staying active, and playing well together as a team. And these findings are the same amongst athletes, whether they be younger, whether they be older, within recreational environments, even up to more competitive levels. What I hear often when we have these con kinds of conversations around prioritizing fun is everyone says, oh yeah, that's great for the six and the eight-year-olds. We want them to have a blast. But as kids get older and become a little more serious, it needs to be about the competition. Fun is a lot less important. The reality is on research on young soccer players, those still remain the important things in their experience. And that idea of fun still being the underlying principle that drives everything else is so important. So principle number one in our club licensing program, prioritize fun. Our second principle, emphasize physical, mental, and emotional safety. Especially right now with all that's going on in the world, safety is paramount. Currently, there's a major focus on sport at the governmental level in terms of safety. And this is as it should be because there's been too many stories recently of organizations that failed to keep young people safe. When you combine this with increased expectations that parents have in our new generation around making sure that their children are in safe environments, you end up with something that becomes a major priority for sport organizations. 
And this isn't just about physical safety. So the things you do as a coach around field inspections, making sure there's no gopher holes where someone might fall and break or they don't fall over on people. It goes beyond that into the mental and emotional safety. So having an environment that's mentally safe for people to be able to make mistakes, to express themselves, to show individual differences. Creating an environment that's emotionally safe. It's free from bullying. It's free from harassment. So at the Canada soccer level, how are we addressing safety? We're really taking a two-pronged approach. We're looking at people and organizations. So from the people perspective, we're using the Canada Soccer Safe Sport roster that some of you may be familiar with. And really what that is, is looking to provide training to ensure that coaches and team personnel have the right tools to be able to, so to foster a safe and healthy environment for young players. So that's making sure that they have the right coach training so that they know the developmentally appropriate types of training and activities to be able to do. They understand the development of young people so they're able to create a positive environment from that side of things. They've taken the respect in sport training so that they've got a better understanding of bullying, harassment, neglect, and abuse. They've got a strong understanding of the importance of concussion training through the Making Headway program, and they've had the proper background screening. So all of these things are in place to be able to support the people within our system to make sure that environments are safe for young players. The other part to that is around organizational development. And this is through the Canada Soccer Club licensing program. And really what that comes down to is creating policies that ensure that organizations set clear behavioral expectations for the people that operate within them. And then that they have clear processes to be able to address any behavior that might not align to those expectations. And that's everything from criminal behavior where we have a requirement uh, as a part of our duty to report in, in Canada, that that's reported to law enforcement, all the way down to areas that aren't at the legal threshold, but may be considered to be inappropriate within the context of working with children. So how do we as organizations make sure that there's clear policies explaining what the expectations are of our people, and then processes to be able to address any situation that may not align to those expectations. I have the, the great fortune to be able to spend some time with uh, Wayne McNeil and Sheldon Kennedy from the Respect Group, uh, who we work very closely with. And, and Wayne always says to us, you can't prevent bad people from doing bad things, but what you can do is create a system where those inappropriate behaviors are recognized and addressed as quickly as possible, because that's the way we change and we, we save uh, the negative impacts of those behaviors on large numbers of people. So. There's a reason why the safety related criteria are first on the list within our club licensing program, as well as them being nearly identical between all of the four categories of licensing. Safety is no less important in our base level, our uh, providers of quality soccer, than it is at our highest level, our national youth club license. Safety is the most important thing when we as parents turn over our children to organizations like yourselves to be able to provide them with great experiences. We shouldn't even have to ask, but given all the things that have happened over the course of the last few years in the sporting world, it's important that we do. And it's important that we as organizations can respond uh, with all of the great things that we're doing to make sure that the, the people within our system are safe. Third principle, we want to provide developmentally appropriate high quality programs. And those are guided by our new Canada Soccer Player Pathway. So as members of the Canada Soccer community, we're all providers of quality programs. So what this means is we provide programming that has appropriate structure, is led by qualified personnel, aligns to the needs of players within our long-term player development model and provides them with the appropriate framework for their programs so that they can enjoy their experience, they can learn, they can make friends, and they can stick with their soccer programs throughout. So we're going to spend a fair amount of time on this in the next webinar that uh, Raheem's luck luckily enough uh, invited me to present on. So uh, it'd be interesting to see how many of this group want to come back and hear me again or how many I uh, chase away during this hour and a half. But uh, we're going to look in that webinar a lot more about balancing quality with accessibility and inclusion. But just to give us a little bit of a tease on this. Uh, I wanted to kind of lay something out for you to think about. So I think most of us that have studied the system in Canada and, and are looking at the numbers are aware that numbers across the board are declining. And that's not unique to Canada and it's not unique to soccer. 
It's a worldwide phenomenon and it's happening in every sport, unfortunately. Uh, even Germany, which uh, most in the global soccer world would say have the best soccer system in the world, and most would say it's by a considerable margin, they're seeing a reduction in the number of players that, uh, that are participating in their sport. So it's not all a function of what we're doing, but certainly there are some things that we can control within that experience that help us to be able to understand uh, and move forward in a way that better supports our participants through good quality programs. So for most organizations that are running high, higher quality programs, so call it your prospects, your elite, your development, your academy, whatever the terminology that you use, we look across the board and we see that a lot of those higher quality programs, they've got waiting lists. They've got big groups of people that come for the big tryout so that they can be selected into that program. On the other side of things, some of our recreational programs, our grassroots programs, our house league programs, whatever it is that you want to call them, those ones are seeing declining numbers. So what we're seeing across the country is that not all programs are impacted equally. And I'll give you an example because I know the, the city, I live in Saskatoon, for those that, that don't know me and, uh, uh, and don't know my background. So uh, as an example, in the past, uh, community associations have run programming up to the age of, used to be U12, more recently U11. Those programs, generally speaking, were lower quality than what the clubs were able to provide because they didn't have the same level of coaching, they didn't have the same training opportunities, competitions weren't set up in the same way. Recently, we've seen organizations from the club side of things or zone side of things in Saskatoon start to offer programming within those grassroots ages. What we're seeing is those club programs are growing by leaps and bounds. There's people signing up for that higher quality program at bigger numbers year in and year out at the expense of some of those community association programs that are seeing declining numbers. What that tells us is that there's an appetite for higher quality programming and higher quality opportunities within those ages. So what I'm trying to say, and I'm going to touch on this when we come to the accessibility and inclusion area, is really as members of the Canadian soccer family, we're providers of quality sport experiences and quality sport programs. It was, it's what differentiates us from kicking around in the park with our friends. So embracing that and providing more of it for more of our players more often for longer periods of time is a way that we can make sure we're adding value to their experience and ideally keeping them engaged for as long as we possibly can. Our fourth principle, we want to maximize attraction, holistic personal development, progression and long term engagement. So what does that mean? Well, traditionally, we've really only had one key performance indicator in youth sport. So the way we determine who the best club is, generally speaking, is by the results on the field. So the club with the biggest trophy case, the one that wins the most tournaments, most leagues, most provincial championships, national championships, they must be the best club. And it's possible that they might be, but it's also possible because we understand in youth sport, there's many ways to be able to achieve results on the field. It may be because of other factors. So it could be that they're actually adopting negative behaviors in order to achieve assess on the field. It could be that they're only selecting, selecting early developers. They're taking the biggest, strongest, fastest. They're playing a style of soccer that's going to lead to results in the short term, but may not necessarily lead to success and in individual development in the long term. They may be shortening their bench so players don't have equal opportunity to be able to play the game. So some of the players are experiencing a great opportunity. They're playing all the time. Others, because they don't have the quality in the short term, aren't getting on the field, and a lot of those players end up leaving the sport. They may even, and I know based on zoning and, uh, and the way geography is in Saskatchewan, it's probably not as big of an issue as we see in other areas of the country, but some of those people may even go to the club down the street and look for a few players that might help them to be able to find a little bit more success on the field and maybe casually invite them to come and play on their team because uh, that's a way that we can have success. And in a lot of ways, you can't blame the individuals within the system for acting that way because our recognition of success rewards that behavior because the organizations that achieve results on the field are the ones that are recognized as having the best quality. So how do we deal with that? Well, we need to create a different way of measuring success. 
And through the club licensing program, we're beginning to do that. So what we're looking at as measures of success that are a lot more aligned to what's important in the youth soccer world. So it's around the idea of attraction. How many players are we bringing into the game? It's about retention. Once they're in the game, how long are we keeping those players engaged either within our club or within the soccer system in general? Because we also want to see progression. We want to see organizations that are preparing players to move on to higher levels of play in the game, whether that be within the club system at uh, levels that your club isn't able to provide. Maybe it's college and university experiences. It's great to have uh, uh, Jerson on the call here. I know he's always excited when organizations are committed to developing good quality players to be able to move into his university and college program. You know, maybe it's professional environments, maybe it's national teams. So there's all kinds of different progression environments, but at the end of the day, it's our responsibility as youth soccer organization to prepare those players that have the ability and the desire to be able to make it to higher levels in the game. And the final piece of the puzzle is, are we focused on transitioning players into other meaningful roles in the club? We all know volunteers are really hard to come by. And we know that they're the foundation and the driver of everything that we do in soccer in Canada. We have an unbelievable resource in our young people. And oftentimes we don't give them the respect that they deserve in terms of the contributions that make, we can make to our game, that they can make to our game. So can we find ways to engage them early and transition them into other meaningful roles in the sport? Can they become coaches? Can they become referees? Can they become volunteers that can support first off maybe in tournament situations or league operations? And eventually can they take on those leadership roles as board members, as youth council members, all of these things that give back to the system and keep us going. We've got a huge number of young people that are desperate to give back. We need to empower them and we need to give them those opportunities because it makes all of our jobs easier. I know as I go across the country and hear from so many organizations, it's so hard to find volunteers in 2020 and it is. Can we use the resources that we have if we facilitate positive experiences from them and they feel a part of your club? They're more than likely going to be willing to give back when the time comes. So can we facilitate that by intentionally creating programs that focus on transition? On the other side of things, can we think about coaches? Can we attract coaches to the game? Once they're in the game, can we keep them involved? Or are they ones that uh, are at the very back of the line and you get to the front of the line on registration day and you're told, you know, if you don't coach, there isn't going to be a team. So they get their bag of balls and off they go and they do it for one year and you never see them again. So can we find better ways of attracting coaches so we don't have to ask for that volunteer at the end of the line? Once they're in, can we give them a positive experience and the support that they need so that they want to come back and do it again the next year? And that's through the development area. So we as clubs, can we help coaches to improve, not just through the formal education, which is our active start fundamentals, learn to train, soccer for life workshops, but from ongoing development, because we know that's how people get better. You're going to get some tools from those workshops and they're going to help you long term as a coach. But what you're doing every day in your club environment and the support that you're getting from your technical leads, from more experienced coaches, from colleagues, that's how you get better. So can we focus on the development of coaches within our club environments? And finally, can we look at progressing coaches on when they're ready so that they can take higher level training? I know Saskatchewan Soccer has done a great job of making sure that C licensed coaches our C license courses and uh, B license courses part one are available now. For many years they weren't. Now they are. We need to make sure that we're pushing coaches to extend that learning if that's what they're looking for. Could be now into our children's license, which is a great opportunity for people who want to become specialists in coaching kids under the age of 12 or into our youth license for people that want to focus on coaching teenagers. So all of these great opportunities for us to progress our coaching knowledge formally but also need to be supported by developing coaching competencies within our club environments. So I've asked this question across the country and generally speaking, people tend to agree with me. Maybe this is the outlier, but if we focused on traction, retention, progression and transition of players, and we did those things better than we do today, would our system be better off? And I think it would be. I think it would also change our behaviors because if these are our measures of success and the organizations that do these things well are the ones that are recognized and rewarded, 
all of a sudden the organizations that are looking for players in other clubs backyards or are releasing players early on because they're not physically developed and they're not able to help them win in the short term those organizations aren't rewarded because those aren't the things that matter in sport and if we think about why we as parents and i'm lucky i've got a uh, an eight-year-old and a ten-year-old that i am currently a parent teacher uh etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, in supporting in, uh, in our current times. But for them, the reason I sign them up for sports is not because I want us to have a really big trophy case at home. It's because I want them to have positive experiences. And I would love it if the organizations that my kids are involved in, whatever, whether it be sport, whether it be arts, whether it be recreation, they're committed to keeping my kids active long-term because that's important to me and that's important to their long-term health and the long-term well-being of our communities. So I think by changing what we measure, we change the behaviors because what you measure matters. Our next principle, focus on participant-centered decision-making. And this one sounds simple and it sounds straightforward. And as I go across the country and meet with organizations, nearly every single one of them has this as one of their core values. So they're all about the player. We're in it for the player. Are we really? And if so, how do we live that experience? So when the chips are down, will we sacrifice that individual for the good of our team? So we need them on our team so that we can win this tournament or this championship. Will we sacrifice them for the good of our club or the good of our league? Because it's more important that they're in that environment so that our organization can be successful than that they're put in the environment that's best for them in order for them to be successful, which really is the most important foundational thing that we can do for individual players. How many of us will profess to know what's in the best interest of the player? So we're going to tell the player what's best for them. We're not going to empower them to be able to make decisions that they feel are best for them in the moment. So I'll give a little bit of a story uh, that I found kind of really resonated with me with an organization that really lived this value. So it was an organization from a different province that I was doing some work with as a part of a national youth club license review. And as a part of their presentation for why uh, they felt as though they should be licensed, they provided a big lengthy list of all of the players that they had pushed out of their club into other environments that were higher up the player pathway than they were able to provide. And I found that really interesting. And I spent some time asking the technical director, you know, why did you want to share that as a part of your technical plan? And what he said is, we recognized as soon as we weren't providing programs within that higher level competition, that it was our job to prepare as many players as we possibly could to be able to move into that environment. So we didn't provide it ourselves, but it didn't mean we wanted to prepare players just for us so that we could have success in the second tier. What it meant to us is we needed to make sure that our players had a pathway so that if they wanted to play at that level, they could. And yes, it was challenging for them at times to push players out. And based on the, the makeup of this club and the community connection that they have, it was challenging sometimes to have players leave because they wanted to stay and represent their home club. But there was a really strong understanding philosophically from the club and a very principle-based approach that they were about pushing players on to higher levels of play because that's what they believed was right for that player. So they lived that value every day, even though it meant that they may not have success at the level that they played. They may not have the volume of players paying fees that they would have uh, had they kept all of those players within the club. But it was a commitment that they made to being participant centered. And it really hit home to me that this is an organization that lives that value. It's not just something that's uh, written on a piece of paper. So when we're making decisions, do we think about whether that's in the best interest of the individual player, or do we get focused on whether it's good for the club, whether it's good for the league, whether it's good for the team? So we all want to celebrate the professional player, the national team player, the college university player that came from our club. But do we, do we, do we always make the best decisions or decisions that are in their best interest along the way to be able to help them get there? Or are there players that may have been able to achieve some of those things had they been pushed into an environment that was better aligned to their needs and not sacrificed for the good of the other organizations? So focusing on the participant, because that's at the center of everything that we do. 
If we make decisions that are in the best interest of the individual, chances are we're gonna provide them with a positive experience, with positive opportunities, and you're going to be remembered when those players are successful at the end, whether it be uh, within the soccer community or somewhere else where there's an opportunity to be able to give back as a coach or as a business leader to become a sponsor or a partner of the club, or just as a parent who's looking for somewhere to enroll their, their child in soccer. They'll remember all of the things that you did for them to help them on their journey and be wanting and want to give back if you put them at the center of everything that you're doing. Our sixth principle, we want to foster accessible, inclusive, and welcoming environments. So I know you had a great webinar for those that, uh, that are doing this as a part of a series with uh, Matt Greenwood from uh, Pickering FC around accessibility programming. And I'm not gonna go into that uh, because first of all, Matt does a way better job of it than I do. He's, uh, he's an expert nationally in that area and certainly uh, a good friend of mine and someone that I call on when I have questions about how we activate within these environments. Uh, it's also the second part of what I talked about uh, with our discussion in two weeks' time for those that I don't chase away tonight. So we're going to be talking about how do we have high-quality programs that are also accessible and inclusive. Uh, so I wanted to introduce to you today, without stealing my thunder from next time, uh, the concepts of polarities or paradoxes from system thinking theory. And to do that, I'll give you a little bit of an illustration. And I'm going to focus today because I know Matt did a lot of work on uh, accessibility programming for athletes with a disability uh, during his environment. So I'm going to think a little bit more around accessibility as it comes to financial barriers to participation. So we'll just draw a little example and, uh, and I'll give you a little bit more information around paradoxes and, uh, uh, and what those mean in our soccer system. So if we think about when we're starting a soccer program for the first time within our community. Generally speaking, we want to provide a program for kids in our area. So we want kids to be able to play soccer. So typically, we created an opportunity or a program that's very accessible and inclusive. We want to get everybody out on the field, and we want everybody to play, and we want everybody to have a great experience. Typically, at the same time, that's usually a low-quality program. We don't typically have a lot of high-end coaches. We don't usually have great facilities, you know, fantastic equipment, beautiful uniforms. We don't usually have all of these things when we're just starting out, and they aren't necessary because it's about getting kids on the field. With that low quality, usually comes low cost. We don't have a lot of overhead. We can offer low quality, uh, sorry, low cost soccer so that it's accessible and inclusive. Over time, as our soccer programming glow, grows and as we start to uh, expand our programming and expand our needs, we start to have a few people and you know sometimes more than a few that want to see a little bit more quality within their programming. They want to be able to have coaching that's a little bit better. They maybe want to be able to start to go to tournaments or other external competitions. They want to start to have equipment or uniforms that better reflect the professionalism of the organization. And what that leads to is an increase in quality. So you've got higher level coaching, you've got higher level facilities, maybe you've invested in, uh, in an indoor facility so that you can play the game year round. And with all of those things that increase quality comes an increase in cost. And over time, as we run these higher quality, higher cost programs, we start to realize, oh shoot, there's a lot of people from our community who can no longer access this program. So our accessibility and inclusiveness has decreased. And we start thinking about why we started this soccer program in the first place. And we realize, oh shoot, we need to make sure that these kids are accessing our program because that's why we're doing it for our community. And the easiest thing to do, or what we typically end up doing, is we start to strip out some of that quality so that we can become accessible and inclusive again. And we end up with a program that's lower cost, has lower quality, and but is very accessible and inclusive. And we end up in this cycle that looks like an infinity curve where we're bouncing back and forth between these paradoxes or polarities and fulfilling one or the other. And the way we get past that is by starting to ask some different questions. So instead of looking at high quality and accessibility and inclusion as polarities that can't coexist, we need to start to think about things like, how can we develop high quality programs that are accessible and inclusive? And when we frame questions that way, 
with smart people, as I know there are some of, and, uh, and uh, for those that don't know, uh, those I don't know, I'm sure you're very smart as well. I know there's a lot of bright people in this game, and I know we can come up with better solutions when we ask better questions. So I'm going to leave this with you as uh, something to ponder for the next couple of weeks if you're uh, uh, going to come and join me again at that point. But how can we create high quality programs that are accessible and inclusive? And the other thing that I want you to think a little bit about is can we evaluate accessibility and inclusion in the same way that we do risk? So we need to recognize that there's always going to be inequalities or any inequities in access the same way there's always going to be risk. So for example, if you offered a free program in every park in your community every day of the week, there would still be people that wouldn't be able to access that program no matter how accessible and inclusive you've tried to make it. The same way, no matter how much we try to remove the risk from soccer, there's always going to be some. So in thinking of it that way, can we think about the awareness of accessibility and inclusion? So have we thought about things in that way? So we know that if we offer a program one day a week at one specific time, and if you can't make it at that time, then I'm sorry you can't be a part of it. That's a different level of accessibility and inclusion than if we offered our program every day of the week in every park for free. So being aware of the barriers to participation that exist every time we develop a program is an important starting point to be able to create mitigation strategies. So how can we create, how can we work within the parameters that we have that dictate our programming in a way that we can make it more accessible and inclusive. And then the final piece is what's our tolerance for accessibility and inclusion? So when we set up our programs, how tolerant are we of individuals who will be excluded? As I said earlier, a program that's offered every day of the week for free in every park has a lot lower tolerance for uh, a lack of accessibility and inclusion than a program that has to take place at five o'clock p.m. on a Monday night when automatically people who work until five o'clock may not be able to participate. So what's our tolerance towards a lack of accessibility and inclusion and what does that inform in terms of how we develop our programs? So uh, a little bit philosophical in that part but something for us to think about and we're going to dive into that in a little bit more detail when we get back together in a couple of weeks and hopefully I didn't scare anybody off and you're still going to want to join me at that point. Um, so even in our discussion I'm going to try to steer a little bit away from that conversation only because I want to have a really uh, uh, kind of lengthy discussion in that area in a couple of week's time but something for us to think about and a bit of a, a preview of the types of things we'll talk about the next time around and our last principle act as a good corporate and community citizen so being a good corporate citizen means we play well with others so we need to work together if we're going to be successful for far too long, and I've been uh, even post-playing career, involved in soccer in Canada for 20 years now, for too long we spent too much of our energy fighting with each other and preventing each other from being successful in order for our entire system to live up to its potential. Unfortunately, in Canada we can't afford to spend our energy fighting if we're going to be successful because compared to our competition, we're under-resourced. So in Canada, we can do everything right, or we have to do everything right, to even give ourselves a chance to be competitive against groups like the United States and Mexico, because they have so many advantages compared to what we do. They have a bigger population, they have a nicer climate, they have bigger budgets, they have professional leagues, although now we've started to, to bridge that with uh, MLS and CPL and support. But they've got a lot of advantages that we don't have. So if we spend any of our energy fighting, we aren't able to spend that developing and growing the game, which even limits our success even more. And I look at Saskatchewan within Canada very similarly to the way I would look at Canada within CONCACAF. So for, Sask for Saskatchewan to be successful, we need to work together and we need to support each other. We need to be a part of the bigger system because we need to do everything right to be able to give ourselves a chance. Groups like Ontario, Quebec, BC, and Alberta, they can do a lot of things wrong, 
and still come out ahead of us more often because they've got a bigger population base, because they've got some advantages with climate in, uh, on the West Coast, because they've got uh, advantages in terms of funding as they do in Quebec through their government support. So there's a lot of advantages that some of those places have. The means that we've got to work together and support a global pathway and support the global good in order for us to be successful because I can tell you going across the country and having these conversations, they're all getting better. Those big provinces that we used to rely on to make mistakes and spend all of their energy fighting so that we have a chance to be successful, they're getting it right more often than not now. And that's going to create an even bigger challenge because of the discrepancy of resources. So now more than ever, we need to work together to be successful. And what that means is supporting each other. It means helping each other out with good ideas. It means supporting the provincial direction and the provincial pathway in the same way that at the Canada soccer level, we're asking all of our provinces to support the national direction so that we can be successful when our teams go and compete in CONCACAF and on the world stage. So it's about pulling together so we can be successful and by acting as a good corporate citizen, it's a strong foundation for that. So be good to work with, be a good partner, be a good contributor, be about the global, not just the individual success of your organization. And the final piece to that puzzle, be a good community citizen. And this one's so important, especially given all that we're going through right now with COVID-19 is, can you be seen as something more than just a soccer provider? So what contributions do we make to our community that help them to see us as an integral part of the fabric of that community? It's so important right now when people, families, individuals, businesses are struggling. So they want to know that they can count on our organizations in the same way we want to know that we can count on them when it comes time to come back to play. But what have we done to earn that respect and build that rapport so that we are seen as something that's important and foundational and our community can't live without? And I'll give you a few examples because there's so many really unique ways of approaching this and understanding what that uh, community engagement component looks like for a club level. Uh, so it's a club that, uh, that I've done a, a, some club licensing work with that has a really strong environmental protection or preservation component. And they've gotten to the point where they spend resources from the club helping the players, especially the young ones within that organization, to understand climate change, to understand the importance of environmental preservation. And it's something that they interweave into club programming, where they work together to raise funds to be able to support environmental causes. They contribute through volunteer opportunities in that way. There's other organizations that volunteer at food banks or soup kitchens to be able to help those that are less fortunate. And it's something that really is integral to how the club operates and is something that they do to give back to the community so that they're recognized as more than just the group that provides soccer. I've got one final uh, kind of unique example from my own personal experience that uh, uh, really helped me to understand what this meant. So when I lived in Ottawa many years ago, uh, I played on a poor recreational men's league team. This team was a part of a bigger club, so they had a collection of men's and women's teams in every division in Ottawa, and it was an adult club. So most adult clubs, you know, you get together and you play your game. If it's, a, if it's that type of, uh, uh, of team, you go out for a drink afterwards and everybody goes on their merry way. And there was a good element to that within this, uh, within this team and within this club, don't get me wrong. It was very much uh, about the social element more than the competitive element at that, part, uh, at that point. But they also had a foundation based on charitable contributions, which I'd never seen in a senior club before. So they ran in their preseason what they called, they called it their charity shield. And it was a little tournament that they played with all of their teams. And in order to participate in the tournament, you needed to come with donations for, uh, for the food bank. So you weren't allowed to come and be a part of this experience that they rolled out to all of the families that were involved, uh, all of the significant others that were involved in that club, and they needed a really fun day in the park. But you couldn't be a part of it unless you brought a contribution to charity. And that kind of was the culmination of the big day as they donated all of, these, uh, all of these contributions to charity. And it really made me realize that this club that I was a part of that I kind of signed up for because I had a friend that I knew from home and I didn't know anybody else in Ottawa and that's where he played. 
Hamilton. So that was what got me involved. And once I went through that the first time, I went, wow, this, this club actually stands for something. It's not just a collection of people. So I challenge you to think of you as a club, what do you stand for? And how do you show that you're a good community citizen? So those are our principles. Prioritize fun, emphasize physical, mental, and emotional safety, provide developmentally appropriate high quality programs, maximize attraction, holistic personal development, progression and long-term engagement, focus on participant-centered decision-making, foster accessible, inclusive, and welcoming environments, and finally act as a good corporate and community citizen. So we feel at Canada Soccer that if we do those seven things well, we're going to have a better system. We're going to be better off in terms of the experiences we provide to our participants. We're going to be recognized in a better way than what we are currently. And ultimately, we're going to be more successful in our outcomes than what we are today. And I've had the chance to be able to give this presentation from coast to coast to coast or presentations like this from coast to coast to coast and talk about our principles. And I haven't yet had anybody stand up and say, you're crazy. These aren't the right things to focus on. Most of the time, I get people standing up and saying, yeah, I can get behind that. These are things that I believe in and that I think we can do a better job of so that we can be more successful. So that's what I'll challenge this group to be. Can you be the messengers that get this communication out to the masses? And can you stand for these things? Can you make these the principles? And remember back to what we said about uh, what a principle was. Can these be things that underlie everything that we do? And can these be things that are foundational in the way we engage and the way we operate every single day? And for those that have been uh, a part of some of John Herdman's talks uh, in the past, he does a great job and is a great expression about this idea of living above the 80% line. So can we be above 80% as often as we possibly can? And that really is a principle-based approach. Can we be good more often than we aren't? And we all recognize we all have our days where we can't be that. But can we be this more often? Can we live these principles? And can we abide by the behaviors that they dictate more often? And just a final piece before, uh, before I open it up to questions and conversation. Just a little quote that we stumbled across uh, as we were starting to build out this program that really resonated with me personally and is something that's kind of driven all of this work uh, towards this idea of being a principles-based approach. So it's from Harrington Emerson, who was an inventor in the 16th century, and what he said was, as to methods, there may be a million and then some, but principles are few. The person who grasps principles can successfully select their own methods. The person who tries methods ignoring principles is sure to have trouble. And what that meant to me is when we embrace these principles, it gives us the freedom to be able to implement them in a way that we think is best because our context is unique, our club is unique, our community is unique, but principles are universal. These things that drive what we do and underscore our behaviors are something that we abide by regardless of what those methods look like. And if we live those principles, we're going to have success regardless of the methods that we use. But if we ignore the principles, no matter what method we try, we're destined to fail because we're not going to have that success because we aren't underlying ourselves with values-based or principles-based sport. So that's it for me, appreciate the time and uh, apologize a bit of a, uh, a monologue there, but certainly uh, I've got as much time as you wanna give to, uh, to have some questions and some positive conversations. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dave, um, for that wonderful presentation on the club licensing principles. So uh, let's open it up to uh, anyone that has some questions regarding um, the application of principles within their own club environments. Um, so any questions that anyone has right off the bat? Tough crowd, I think I put everybody to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot to digest. I, uh, I appreciate that. And I, uh, I also understand that we've all got a lot on our minds right now <laughs> and, uh, and getting some heavy concepts and some heavy philosophical conversation. It's not always easy to interpret that and turn that around quickly and, uh, uh, and present it in some type of question. 
So I, I take no offense to this, and I assume that I was uh, uh, as unexciting as usual, and, uh, and everyone may have just left or turned their, uh, their screens off as I got uh, to about principle number three. Well, well actually, we have, a, we have a couple questions coming in, Dave, so you're not off the hook Perfect. just yet. Yeah. Um, Jason. Uh, hi, Dave. It's Jason Coates. I'm the president of Nanaimo United FC. Um, I'm a big fan and believer in, in, in values-based leadership and, and, and principles as, as really guiding tools for, uh, for, for organizations. So I, everything you're saying, I'm a, I'm a big believer. Um, do you have any good examples of um, organizations that have had a lot of success sort of spreading those principles? So like most organizations, we're really striving to be good community citizens. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of entrenched ideas and, and uh, uh, old ways of doing things or, you, you know, just the, the regular part challenges of, of multi-organizational governance. So do you have any examples of, of organizations you have seen spread the word really well and how they did it? Yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot uh, of, I guess, different organizations that do it in different ways and a lot of, of success stories. And I will kind of start that by saying we're obviously just at the infancy of this kind of principle-based approach and club licensing in particular. So there's a lot of work still to be done, but certainly there are some early adopters that have spent time, uh, I guess, uh, uh, reinforcing what they stand for and what people can expect from them. And I think there's a few good examples of that. One that I, that I do like to share is around the idea of being a good corporate citizen. And I've seen that and uh, uh, I'm going to give them a, a little bit of recognition. They don't always deserve it, but uh, in Ontario with their uh, OPDL, their Ontario player development league, which is their standards based league that kind of sits at the top of the pyramid of, uh, of play in Ontario. In the three years uh, plus that I've been working with them uh, and the clubs within that, I've really seen a change in their the way they behave towards each other. So this idea of being a good corporate citizen. So it's created an environment where they actually are heavily invested in helping each other to get better. They've recognized that the quality of the league is only as good as its weakest members and they want the quality to improve. So they're all helping each other to be able to get better. And it's very much a departure from what we've traditionally seen in the club world, where it's very much about this is mine, you know, this is my recipe for success, or these are my tricks of the trade. And I can't share them with you because then you might be successful as well. Uh, it's moved beyond that to a point of really an open environment where there's lots of sharing going on. And that really kind of hit home for me as this uh, kind of COVID-19 situation was evolving. And I got a, uh, it was a screenshot of, uh, of a meeting that was going on from one of the executive directors of one of those clubs. And it was a group of, it was probably about eight or nine of them. Uh, that had kind of convened their own meeting together to talk about how they were dealing with staffing, what grants might be available, how they were going to handle this, uh, this situation within their own clubs. And this was not with guidance with Ontario Soccer. It wasn't through any guidance from Canada Soccer. It was through their own leadership and from the relationships that they built through that uh, kind of work alongside the league. And it kind of got me thinking, you know what, they're, they figured that part of it out because these people really are invested in helping each other. And it was a cultural shift because I think we've seen in most areas of the country in most league environments, we see the other clubs as our competitors, not as our allies. And I apologize, those that have taken the children's license, you, you've heard this story before, uh, but there's a great article that, uh, that I came across as I was building out some uh, training around appropriate competition that looks at competition as an analogy of war and competition as an analogy of collaboration. So in the analogy of war, it's about, the, the ultimate goal is to win. It's to vanquish your opponent because that's what war is. And while that might be appropriate, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a Liverpool man, so I love when we destroy Everton and Manchester United and vanquish them. I have no problem with that, and neither do most supporters. When we apply those principles in youth sport, that's a different beast because our outcomes are different. 
So this idea of competition is collaboration where we need each other and our role is as colleagues to be able to facilitate quality competition is something very different. And when we reframe our thinking in that area, it leads us to want to behave a little bit differently. So for me, that was a good example of a group that's lived, it's just that one principle around being a good corporate citizen, but they've really taken that on and it's really changed the, the, uh, the dynamic of soccer in Ontario. I grew up there and, and played there and, and I've got a fair amount of experience with clubs there. And it used to be, uh, for those, those that are around, uh, that have been around soccer there, I think you'll agree, uh, kind of a dog eat dog world and, and survival of the fittest. And it's really not that anymore. And it's allowed them to make progress when in past they haven't been able to do that. So uh, it's just one example. I've got others. If, if there aren't any other questions, I certainly can uh, can dig in a few of those uh, into my bag for a few more others. But uh, but hopefully that's a, an example of, of one of the principles in action anyway, uh, in terms of, of something that's happened in the last little while. No, that's great. Thanks. And I, I love that to uh, facilitate quality competition and collaboration versus competition. That's a great even that alone is a good little tool to use. So thanks. Yeah, no problem. And it, it, as coaches, I mean, that's really what we are. It's, uh, I know a lot of you on the call are coaches. Uh, I am as well. It, you know, I don't enjoy a game where we win by 10 goals or lose by 10 goals. It's not fun for anybody. We don't learn anything. So it's my job as a coach to work with my colleague who is coaching his team to see how we can create an environment where we can all thrive. And that's very different than, uh, you know, when, uh, when Jurgen Klopp is on the sideline, he's not really looking to collaborate with his opposition to be able to create a good environment. He's looking to score as many goals as he possibly can and celebrate them with fist bumps and big toothy grins and running down the sideline and all kinds of craziness. <laughs> Dave, would you be able to go back a slide just so that we can Absolutely. see the seven mm -hmm. principles? Yeah, no problem. Well, I hope I can anyway. I say absolutely, but I got to figure out how to do it. There we, Got it. <laughs> um, we have another hand up from someone that you may know, Lara. Hi, Dave. Hey, Lara. Uh, so I'm curious to know, um, of these seven, for the Canadian soccer community, um, do you think that one of these uh, has the largest gap to overcome? Ooh, that's a very good question. Huh. I would say probably that, and only because it's just a completely new way of thinking about things. Um, number four, around maximizing attraction, uh, holistic development, progression, long-term engagement, because we've never really measured those things and we've never really thought about them. So I think changing behaviors and focusing on those things rather than the results on the field is probably the one that will take the longest for people to kind of get their head around and really start to understand why that's a better way of measuring things. So I think that one is one that jumps out to, to me. Um, I think the other one is around being a, a good corporate and community citizen. And it's just, the nature of the way soccer has always been, and again, I've been around it for more years than I care to mention, you know, 20 now as, uh, uh, as, a, as someone involved from a, from a working perspective. And the, the system has always been set up a w in a way where, you know, it's my job to fight with the guy down the street. It's my job to fight with my governing body. So I know we don't have that same, quite the same governance structure here as other areas, but you know, the club, it's the club's job to fight with the district. It's the district's job to fight with the province. It's the province's job to fight with Canada soccer. And, and that's just been the way the system's always been structured because, you know, we're competitive people and we compete on the field. So we must also need to compete in the boardroom. So I think that's the other one to me that, uh, it started to change. I think there's a lot more better relationships now than there used to be, but I think there's still this lack of trust in the system where we always assume that people are making decisions because they're out to get us or they're trying to make our lives more difficult. And having worked now at nearly every level within the system, I can assure you there's nobody that's I've met anyway, that's ever spent any time thinking about how can I make a decision to screw over these other people? 
It's generally they're making the decisions that are the best that they can with the information that they have at the time that they have it. And sometimes they get it wrong, and sometimes we need to hold our hand up and be, uh, and be big enough to say, look, I got this wrong and I'm sorry, and here's how we're going to fix it. But most of the time, they're making the decisions that they think are right. And the other challenge to that is we're not always privy to all of the information that other people have. So when we sit at the provincial level, as, as you know, Lara, there's all of these influencers that, that, that impact the decisions that we can make. So you need to appease Canada Soccer as your governing body. You need to appease Sasport and the government as your funding agency. You need to appease your membership. And sometimes those different groups have different needs or different uh, requirements, and it leads to decisions that may make some of them feel like you're out to get them. Uh, but understanding and, and I guess trusting that we're making the best decisions we can with the information that we have at the time that we have it, rather than always assuming the worst of people, I think is something that's going to take time because the reality is we've gotten to that point because there's a lot of scars and a lot of scabs and a lot of wounds in the soccer world. And it takes a long time to rebuild trust and a very short period of time to destroy it. So for me, those are probably the two that stick out as being the biggest challenges. I think the other ones, people generally can get behind. I think the idea of fun, whether we do it or not, is a different question. But I think the idea that sports should be fun, I, I don't see anybody arguing with that. Uh, with all that's gone on, for those that follow sport, all that's gone on in skiing south of the border with swimming in the UK and their soccer academies, I think this concept of safety, um, I can't see people arguing with that. Um, the idea of developmentally appropriateness, I think we've gotten on board with that through LTPD, LTAD, which has been around now for more than 10 years which is kind of that tipping point for most of those types of initiatives um, I think people can understand they don't always do it but they can understand the concept of participant centered decision making uh, decision making and I also think people really would like programming to be accessible and inclusive and welcoming they don't always know how to do that but I think those ones uh, I see a lot more people working against and trying to move forward. So the two, I guess, long answer to a short question, the two that jump out at me most are around those new key performance indicators and that idea of being a good corporate citizen and working for the greater good. Thanks, Dave. No Any problem. other questions um, for Dave? Uh, I, I might have one or two for you, Dave, but we have one from Jerson, so you're saved. Jerson, what, uh, yeah, thanks for putting your mic on. Hi, Dave, uh, thanks for your presentation and I uh, appreciate it. I have uh, plenty of questions, but I'll keep it to one and two and maybe I'll connect individually and, and uh, some are more practicality pieces and others are global. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll ask the, the global ones and hopefully, I'm interested, are there any other sports in Canada that are doing this? Not yet, but there will be. <laughs> okay. And uh, some of the, the reason I say that is uh, there's, there's a lot of interest in what we're doing. There aren't nearly as many people who are brave enough to walk out to the end of the diving board with us yet, but I've had a lot of conversations with, uh, with different sports and some great conversations actually with some of the academics that we do work with uh, that, that research sport and they've, they've really reinforced that conceptually it, uh, it makes sense and it's aligned to what sport should be and it does have the opportunity and I had this from uh, uh, one of the researchers that we work with out of York University who said if you know if you can pull this off it changes the way sport is delivered in Canada and I've had a lot of, of interactions with other sports where they're saying you know what we're really interested but we want to see if you can do it first so I think once we get to the, uh, the point where we have some of those examples of practical implementation and on the, the KPI side of things, the ability to measure them. So right now we don't have the system to be able to measure those KPIs. We also don't really have a system to be able to measure the, uh, I guess the, how deeply ingrained these principles have become within the system. 
but that's the next step in the process. So it's been conceptualized. We just need the technology support to be able to do it effectively. And I think once we're able to do that and we're able to measure these things in a way that it's valid, then all of a sudden we're going to see, I think a lot more people go, you know, I'm going to give that a try too, because uh, I can see some results. So uh, the short answer is they're not moving there yet. The longer answer is uh, I think we're going to see a lot more people following down this pathway sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Fred. And just kind of addition to that, <clears throat> and, and maybe you mentioned it, and I apologize if you did, what will success look like, like of this? Like, how, how are we going to measure that this idea and, and can, I guess, pro, um, piece that we're adding, like, what is it success? Is it our numbers of, of kids participating, or is it more clubs kind of <clears throat> engaging in, in this process? Like, how do we how do we know that it's actually helping us or, or moving us in the right direction? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I've thought a lot about that and I think it's all of the above. So the way I would look at it as is because we're just starting down this pathway, obviously we need to establish a baseline. Uh, in this day, you know, 2020, we really don't know what a good retention rate is, for example. You know, maybe clubs should be retaining 90% of their players. Maybe it's only 50%. Uh, we've got some of those, some of that data in uh, in provinces that have the ability to measure it, but we need to be able to get those baselines so that we can understand what average is, and also be able to look at some of the outliers, those that do it really well, those that are having challenges in that area, and that goes across all of these principles. So we need the ability to measure the, and I put this in quotations, the softer ones as well. So how do we know if an organization is prioritizing fun? How do we know if an organization is focusing on participant-centered decision-making? So we've got, uh, got a, a, a process or, or a method that we're borrowing from the business world to try to address that around a 360 review where we ask them. We ask the organization to self-analyze. We ask for their governing organization to analyze them. We ask their participants, the parents and players, to provide feedback. And we ask for organizations to do a peer-to-peer -peer review. And we use all of that information to start to, uh, to triangulate and look for patterns. But I think being able to establish what the baseline looks like, and then over time to be able to see improvement, I think is the key. Because I think that's what success looks like. So uh, when we talk about the KPIs, if we're seeing an increase in attraction, retention, progression, transition, that's mm -hmm. obviously positive for the system. So if we're seeing more kids joining the game, the ones that do join the game that are staying longer, we're getting more players reaching higher levels of play, and we're also having an easier job attracting the coaches to be able to support that system, uh, board members, other volunteers, that's a, that's a great indicator of success. So it's, it's all of those things combined, and it's moving forward from a baseline to something that's an improvement over where we started. And then not settling continuing to push that so that we still dig in and we still find ways to be able to improve from there. Like I know we all try to do as, as both individuals and coaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I appreciate that. I uh, have a few more, but I'll, uh, I'll stop there. I'll let the rest ask. Perfect. And, and this goes for anyone on the call, uh, by all means, if anyone wants to have uh, an individual conversation and, uh, and follow up on any of this, uh, please do contact me. Uh, uh, Raheem is able to, to provide my contact information. It's not rocket science, dnud at canvassoccer.com. It's, uh, it's uh, on the website. It's available. So if anybody wants to, to connect because they're not comfortable asking questions or like Jerson want to dig in on some specific things for their club, uh, send me a quick email and we'll definitely organize a time to continue the conversation. Dave, one, one question that popped into my head as uh, you were responding to Jerson's last question was actually the potential to add an additional measure um, when measuring success, which would be um, in organization retention. So having, you know, youth and teenage athletes start to contribute back, whether it's as a referee or a coach within their organization, mm -hmm. um, just because that helps create that you know, that self-sustaining um, or, or helps create a bit of um, the ability for, for the athletes to contribute back, take on leadership roles, um, improves, you know, you know, can potentially work on their holistic personal development, 
Um, but I'm, you know, is, are, are you seeing that specifically across the country right now? Are organizations focusing on how can we use the players that are currently within our programs and bring them into the fold as referees and coaches? Um, or is that somewhat of an afterthought and the reliance is still on sort of that adult volunteer coach? Yeah, so that, that would be our transition measure. So it's one of those KPIs. So just to differentiate it from, uh, from the other types of retention, which would be retention within the club as a player and then retention within the system as a player as well. So uh, those two different measures of retention because you know players that move on to higher levels of play or players that age out into adult soccer, they're still retained. They just maybe aren't retained by the club. So just to, to keep the language a little bit more simple, uh, that transition measure would be the measure around uh, transitioning players in particular into other meaningful roles within the club. So coaching, refereeing, volunteers and whatnot. Um, I think there are some organizations who are progressive in that area and have started to do uh, an intentional uh, job in that space. So our National Youth Club License organizations, one of the requirements or standards that they need to meet is they need to have a coach attraction, retention, development, progression, and evaluation plan. Then one of the components of that is it needs to focus on transitioning players into coaching roles. So they're actually obligated through the licensing program to put intentional focus on that, uh, uh, on that element. And it's amazing how many of them were already doing it, uh, how many of them were doing it, a lot of them informally, where it was kind of a shoulder tap type of thing, like, hey, you interested in coaching? Uh, and what we've said to these organizations is, let's be intentional here. This is a huge resource, as you've identified, and we know volunteers are hard to come by. So can you start to engage some of these individuals? Can you provide uh, coaching workshops to your older players and have them serve as assistant coaches or, uh, or if you're running a station-based program, station leaders with your younger players? Can we uh, set up our programs in such a way that uh, – there's an opportunity for us to be able to referee and coach because our under 17s or under 18 players aren't playing on the same night as they might be referee. So there's some of it that's, uh, that's systematic that can prevent us or create a barrier. There's some of it that is strategic, which is we need to give an opportunity. And, uh, and for me anyway, I'm always amazed at, how often we underestimate youth and you know I put myself in that same boat they're so capable of so much more and they have such an ability to connect with children in a way that we as adult coaches can't and they're this captive resource that are desperate to be asked to help and then in some places in the country I don't know if Saskatchewan is one of these they also have some volunteer work that they have to do as a part of their high school curriculum that you know maybe they might want to spend coaching and we as soccer organizations, we've got a whole bunch of volunteer hours that we need to be filled. So some of those types of ideas where we can create those strategies are being intentional in that area. So how are we going to engage those players? What are the resources that we have that we can use to attract them? Once they're in, what can we do to support them and make sure they stay as coaches? And can we help those that show some competency to become better coaches? I know some of the people on this call uh, have been coaching since they were you know, 15, 16 years old and they're still doing it today. So what if what's happened through that experience that's made you want to keep coaching and continue to give back? So uh, I think it's a great point, and it's certainly one of the KPIs that we've identified as, as being a, uh, a primary measure of success within youth soccer is organizations that do that well, that's one of those four measures of success that we're using to determine quality. Thanks for the answer, Dave. Appreciate it. Um, any questions from, from anyone else on the call? Dave, perhaps before we wrap up, um, I know you had uh, made mention of some of the things that we're going to talk about on the next call. Um, which I think will be a really interesting topic to speak about. So if you just want to reiterate some of the things that are coming up on the next call and any questions that, you know, you're hoping people can can sort of go away and spend the next couple of weeks thinking about um, and coming with some ideas and questions for the for the June 4th webinar, that'd be great.
Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm excited for that one. It's the first time I've done kind of a, a full session focused only on that topic. So uh, I'm, I'm eager for feedback because I think it's something that might be valuable to other organizations that are struggling with this, uh, with this challenge as well. And it's a real one. You know, I, I put the infinity curve up there and, uh, and talked a little bit about the idea of polarities or, uh, and and how are paradoxes and that balance between quality and accessibility and inclusion. Um, so I think some of the things to think about is, you know, how can we be creative and provide high quality programs that are also accessible and inclusive versus looking at the two as mutually exclusive. So if we're going to have an accessible program, it can't have any quality. Or if we're going to have a high quality program, we need to sacrifice accessibility and inclusion. So how can we sit in that middle of the infinity curve where we've got both? Uh, and then the other piece is just giving some thought to what accessibility and inclusion means and the, the, the awareness component of it. So understanding how every decision we make from a programming perspective is going to have an an impact on accessibility and inclusion, whether it's the day of the week, whether it's the cost, whether it's the timing, whether it's the number of sessions, uh, whether it's mandatory attendance versus optional, whether it's uh, a situation where there's a, a finite number of spots and there's going to be a selection criteria, all of these things create a level of accessibility and inclusion. So what are the types of things that we can do to make sure we're aware of them? How tolerant are we of that? So do we want to create the private club that is uh, uh, very exclusive and, uh, and is very limited in its accessibility? Or are we committed to accessibility and inclusion? Do we want to provide more opportunity for more players more often for longer periods of time? And if so, what do we need to be able to do to create those mitigation strategies uh, to use risk management terms? So how do we overcome the inequalities of accessibility and inclusion that come with those decisions that we have to make because we've got finite resources. So I think that's maybe a, <laughs> a really deep philosophical challenge to everyone is we know we don't have infinite resources. You know, as much as we would all love to, we know we can't offer free programming in every park in the city, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We've got some restrictions on our capacity that means we need to make some decisions that are going to limit the accessibility and inclusion of some of our programs. So what are some of the strategies that we can use to be able to understand what those decisions mean and how we might be able to mitigate the impacts that those have on as many people as we possibly can because a good friend of ours that does a lot of work with Canada soccer and is kind of a, uh, a podcast legend and I know a few of you have probably listened to some of his stuff uh, Marco Sullivan from uh, from Sweden who works with AEK Stockholm uh, and he's got a saying that we want as many as we can for as long as we can in the best environment possible so the best environment possible side of things speaks to the high quality of the program, the as many as we can for as long as we can speaks to the accessibility and inclusion. So how can we live that ideal and have as many as we can for as long as we can in the best environment possible? Because that's going to maximize our chances of having players that are going to remain in the game and hopefully progress to higher level environments so that we have more uh, Brett Levis, we have more Alfonso Davies, we have more Christine Sinclairs, we have more uh, more of these players that are reaching the highest level of the game, but we also have more players within the system that allow us to have high quality, viable adult programming, high quality, viable under 17 or under 19 programming so that everyone in the system can find a home. So a um, little bit philosophical way to present it, but uh, I'm looking forward to some of the discussion and certainly uh, two weeks time, I hope anyway, it's going to be a lot more uh, kind of engagement conversation discussion, uh, a little bit less of me talking, I'll need more glasses of water. Uh, so I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation. And I know from some of the smart people that, uh, that are going to be on that call, if it's a similar group to what we had today, uh, I know we're going to get some really good solutions that you can take back to your club, some ideas that you hadn't considered, because I think that's really what we want to have at the end of this is things that you can take away tangibly and use. 
because there's no point in us just uh, talking philosophy if we can't do any kind of practical implementation. So uh, hopefully that's where we'll arrive at and, uh, and I'm looking forward to it. Wonderful, Dave. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Um, I'll give the floor you know, a few more seconds in case anyone uh, just thought of a question that they wanted to ask. Otherwise, uh, we'll wrap up in, uh, in a few, in 30 seconds or so. So any other last questions from anyone? While we have, while we have Dave captive. <laughs> so be careful how we say that in this day and age, we're all captive, unfortunately. <laughs> that is very true. Um, all right. So it doesn't look like anything, uh, Dave, thank you again for your time. Um, I know it's 8 p.m. and you've taken some time away from your family and I know how hard you work on a daily basis. So I'm sure they haven't seen you much today. It's uh, very much appreciated. Uh, thank you to all those who have taken time as well to participate. Um, I'm looking forward to the June 4th workshop. And uh, if you haven't registered, please make sure to do so as soon as possible. And you know, if there are others within your organization that you think would benefit from this information, uh, then please don't hesitate to share uh, share the details with them. So uh, thank you again, Dave. Uh, very much appreciated. And, uh, you know, to everyone out there, just be safe and spend time with your loved ones um, this weekend, which is a long weekend. So take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate the time and, uh, and appreciate your audience. And looking forward to two weeks' time. And by all means, if anyone... Uh, wants to connect, uh, please feel free to reach out and I would look forward to sharing some continued conversation. And thanks Raheem for organizing. I appreciate it and appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Dave. Sure. Thanks Raheem. Thanks guys. Thanks you.